gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Before I proceed to my um, my line of question, I just wanted to clarify, Ms. Sampson, can you, uh, again, just for the record, clarify uh, whether gun manufacturers enjoy legal immunity? Thank you. Gun manufacturers do not necessarily enjoy complete immunity, but what they do have is an unnecessary level of protection from PLACA that makes it much more difficult for victims of their misconduct to hold them accountable in court. And what that means is that for most other industries, if an individual is harmed by their misconduct, they can file a claim and then in a court of law, they can decide whether or not that claim has merit. With PLACA, what gun manufacturers are able to do is get in front of the courthouse doors and say, you have to get over a hurdle before you can even get to the merits. And that's not asking for anything that would be especially punishing to gun manufacturers. All we're asking is that gun manufacturers be held to the same standards as everyone else. And that's especially important right. because they don't even face um, consumer oversight. So they, they, they receive special treatment when it comes to the way uh, manufacturers generally have to face uh, legal liability for for their products. Thank you for that. Let me let me get to why I think they might have some special treatment here. Um, we know that it's been very hard to get legislation passed in Congress that would uh, address gun violence. We finally last month were able to achieve some bipartisan legislation to help stem the tide of gun violence in our country. Uh, the reason it's been so difficult is because for decades, there's been this powerful grasp of special interests, which has stymied progress on even the most common sense gun reforms. I'm going to put some numbers out here. According to lobbying data, gun rights groups spent a staggering $190 million, nearly $200 million on lobbying between 1998 and 2022. According to public records, the NRA itself spent $5.3 million on lobbying from 2021 to 2022, while the National Shooting Sports Foundation, a lobbying organization representing gun makers, distributors, and retailers, and by the way, upon whose Board of Governors Mr. Daniel sits, spent over a million dollars on federal lobbying just in the first three months of 2022. We also know that in 2015 and 2016, Ruger gave the NRA over $12 million in cash payments, which is a staggering sum. And these sums of money have their effect. They have a very pernicious effect on our democracy. Uh, Mr. Bussey, you are a gun owner and a former firearms executive. Do you agree that the views of the NRA as an organization where they put their lobbying dollars, not necessarily every rank and file member of the NRA, because they're very responsible gun owners among that group, but the NRA as an organization, their views do not represent the views of the majority of Americans, including the majority of responsible gun owners like yourself. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. I certainly agree with that. Thank you. 60% of gun owners actually support raising the age for Americans to purchase AR-15s from 18 to 21. The NRA clearly doesn't speak for the majority of Americans. They don't even speak for a majority of ordinary gun owners. Ever since the Supreme Court's devastating decision in Citizens United, groups like the NRA have been ever more empowered to drown out the voices and the votes of everyday Americans by funneling dark money into our political process. In 2016 alone, the NRA spent upwards of $54 million on independent expenditures to candidates and parties, nearly double the amount it spent during the 2014 midterm elections and more than double the expenditures during the 2020-2012 election cycle. Much of this amount, $34 million, was rooted through the NRA's Institute for Legislative Action, the organization's lobbying arm, which is not subject to donor disclosure laws. These funds were used to support the election of pro-gun politicians and systematically block legislative action to crack down on gun trafficking and straw purchasing or strengthening background checks and enacting red flag laws. Now, fortunately, these reforms were enacted as part of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act last, last month, but even now the grip of the gun lobby and the dark money that funds its efforts continues to threaten the progress of further efforts to address America's gun violence epidemic. 
if we are able to comprehensively address this crisis, it will depend on getting dark money out of our political system and make democracy responsive to everyday Americans. Those are the steps we must take to address uh, these insidious factors of big money, special interests, and these particular industries like the gun lobby. With that, I yield back my Gentleman time. Yields